Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare with Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. This week, we welcome Dr. Francis Collins, Director of the National Institutes of Health, talking about the ongoing COVID pandemic, deadly variants, vaccines in kids, and NIH research on long COVID. We're speaking today with Dr. Francis Collins, Director of the National Institute of Health, the largest biomedical and public health research agency in the world. He's been leading the agency since 2009. Before that, Dr. Collins was director of the National Genomic Research Institute, where he oversaw one of the most significant biomedical accomplishments of modern times, the mapping of the human genome. Dr. Collins, welcome back to Conversations on Healthcare. I'm glad to join you at this propitious time as we continue to struggle with COVID-19. Yeah, and speaking of that, you know, millions of parents are taking their children back to school, and many of the children are under the age of 12 without the benefit of a vaccine. And now you've said that the vaccine approval for younger kids may not come until late fall at the earliest, Uh, but just recently the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a request to speed up emergency use authorization for younger kids uh, because of the risk to their health uh, has increased significantly with the Delta uh, variant. What's the likelihood we'll see the vaccine uh, authorization for younger children sooner than you had expected? And, and really, why don't we have better fix on dates certain for approval? That's a good question. First of all, let's be clear that kids from 12 up uh, can be immunized. That has been approved for a while. And unfortunately, only about half of them so far have been vaccinated. And those kids are going back to school too. I had hoped we'd be in a better position then in terms of having that group of students uh, less likely to be the source of outbreaks. So we have a broader problem here just in terms of public acceptance of vaccines, both for adults and kids. But I get it that particularly parents who have kids under the age of 12 concerned about schools opening up again, wish that there was a way that those kids could have also been immunized. The challenge, of course, is you don't really want to begin to advocate uh, for any kind of medical intervention for children under 12 unless you're really sure you got it right. You can't consider kids as just being little miniature humans. They have different physiology and different metabolism. So the data has to be generated by doing very carefully conducted clinical trials on kids of that age. That has been done but it's not quite complete as far as the follow-up for any kind of safety signals. As I understand it, that data will be submitted by Pfizer to FDA later this month, near the end of September. And then FDA will need to look at the data. Now, if everything looks perfect and there's no surprises and the efficacy and the safety are all beautiful, then you could imagine FDA granting approval in maybe just a month or so. But if there's any tricky thing there where they need to ask more questions, get some additional details, it could take a little longer. So I think we all gotta be careful here, better not to overpromise. I guess previously I've said, well, I think by the end of the year, I would love it if that happened to be October, <laughs> but it could certainly linger a little longer than that. And I totally get it why everybody's impatient. I am too. Yeah. Well, right up there uh, in the news, of course, is the issue of a booster for all the folks who have been vaccinated. Uh, FDA now recommending a third uh, booster uh, for those fully vaccinated, and especially if they're medically compromised. I think you've uh, said in the past that maybe rather than rolling out the third uh, dose of vaccine, you'd rather see the unvaccinated getting their first dose of vaccine. What are your feelings now around the booster and how important this is as we worry about protection waning over time and the new coming variants, Lambda and now Mu, possibly mm. evading our vaccine protection even further. What, what's, the, what's your uh, thought about boosters at this point? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, I would say the number one priority is to get those who have not yet been vaccinated, haven't even gotten their first dose, Uh, to do so. Those are the people at the greatest risk right now, especially with Delta, which is so incredibly contagious and may also be more severe than its predecessor virus variants. And so those 85 million people are sitting ducks right now and everything we can do to try to convince them to look at the evidence and make a choice to roll up their sleeve has got to be number one priority. But I don't think uh, we ought to make this an either or. When it comes to boosters, 
since I made the statement that you quoted, we've got more data now looking to see what's really happening as far as the effectiveness of the vaccines in providing protection over time. A lot of this data actually comes from Israel. Uh, they've had a very complete ascertainment of what's happening in their relatively small country, and they have a single vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. So we can really look and see what's going on. And it's pretty clear that the people who got immunized first back in January are now showing more breakthrough infections, including some that are not just mild, but some that seem more severe. Mm -hmm. That's not too surprising, but now we can actually see the evidence for it. We're seeing some of that also now in the US and data collected by CDC. So it makes sense to begin to prepare for boosters so that people who have been immunized can really give their immune system another jolt of reminder <laughs> about what to watch out for, especially against Delta. And the good news is the vaccines work against Delta, but as they wane over time, they just need another kick. And that's what the boosters are supposed to do. Dr. The FDA right now is looking at that data. They will then decide there'll be a meeting on September 17th where they publicly discuss the evidence for boosters. CDC and their advisory committee will then make a recommendation. And as soon as September 20th, that week, uh, we might then see a recommendation coming forward for boosters, beginning with the people who got immunized first, which are mostly elderly people and healthcare providers. They were first in line and they should have been. So this is all a work in progress. It's based upon science. There's nothing arbitrary about this. One other thing to say, the people who should get boosters right now, or maybe we should just call them third doses, are the people who are immunocompromised. We know that they don't always get a full response to the standard vaccines, the two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or the one dose of J&J. &J. Those folks, as of a month ago, were encouraged to go ahead and get another dose to try to be sure that their immune system which is a little sleepy from chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy for organ transplant patients, gets just one more chance uh, to give them that kind of immunity. Well, that's a great reminder for those that are immune compromised. You know, Dr. Collins, you oversaw the human genome, uh, a remarkable, the, the mapping of the human genome, uh, really a remarkable feat. Uh, but surviving three presidential administrations in the current political uh, uh, climate is also a remarkable achievement. And I'm wondering if you could talk about your experience leading uh, the world's largest uh, biomedical research institute under President uh, Obama, Trump, and Biden. And how do we lessen the sting of politics, which can have such a negative effect on the world of research? Well, it has been an interesting ride, and I feel really privileged to have been given the opportunity to play this role. Fortunately, in most situations, medical research uh, is not quite as politicized as everything else, although there have certainly been exceptions mm -hmm. with COVID-19. Uh, regardless of your political party or other persuasions, most people are really concerned about health issues, want to see advances made that would help prevent terrible diseases like cancer and heart disease and diabetes. And so that's what we do. And so we've been fortunate to be able to make that case and to get support uh, from administrations and from the Congress over these years. The problem that has really become much more severe, though, now relates to COVID-19 and how the current polarization of our country about almost everything has played out in a circumstance where it really has been destructive. Your political party really shouldn't be the main reason for you to have a view about vaccines or mask mandates, but that's turned out to be the case. And so things that really should be based upon evidence and the truth of what we actually know get colored over and that is further com made complex uh, by social media and the way in which misinformation spreads oftentimes more quickly than the truth. I do worry about that, not just about what it's done to COVID-19, but about the future of our country. If we're in a circumstance where truth has somehow stopped having the same purchase that it should on our decision making and other things like politics conspiracies and just random opinions uh, seem capable oftentimes of pushing truth aside. That is not a good place uh, for the most technological nation on the planet to be. And I hope we can 
begin somehow to learn the lessons because the culture wars that are now so much affecting COVID-19 are killing people. Uh, we've lost 600,000 people. Most would estimate that if we'd had a better management of our public health circumstances based on evidence, uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of those lives could have been spared. This is really yeah. serious. Yeah. Well, it is so heartbreaking uh, to have lost people after we had the vaccine. You know, in those early months when we had no vaccine, we just longed for the vaccine. To have lost people afterwards is truly heartbreaking. And I, I wonder if I can ask you, Dr. Collins, uh, to comment on certainly an issue that many organizations struggle with, um, in, in which people uh, have, have uh, expressed that their faith is a reason to issue the vaccine. Um, and I know your own faith journey has informed your approach to science. And I, I wonder what your uh, thoughts are as you see people um, put forth their religion or their faith as the reason that they are refusing or if they're in an employment situation, sometimes seeking an exemption uh, to accept the vaccine. How, how do you answer that in terms of the science as we continue to navigate this pandemic? Well, thanks for that question. I, I am a person of faith as well as a scientist, and I have not seen a conflict between those worldviews since I became a Christian at age 27. But many people do perceive such a conflict, and it may mean that people of faith sometimes are more suspicious of scientific developments because they think they are secular or maybe even atheist in their perspective. Actually, 40% of working scientists believe in God, so it's not as if there is this big divide, but sometimes it looks that way from the outside. So I would argue that this is another place where we really have some work to do to try to help understand that science for the perspective of a believer is actually a way of understanding God's creation, and it's a gift to be able to do so, and to then use that information to try to alleviate suffering. When people pray for deliverance from a medical disaster, what are they actually praying for? Well, perhaps some miraculous intervention, but oftentimes I think the intervention comes about through the way in which science provides answers. And that's where we are with COVID. So many people of faith have been praying that this epidemic could be managed, that it wouldn't uh, threaten the lives of themselves and their families. And we have an answer to that prayer. It's called the vaccines, which are remarkably safe and effective. And it puzzles me uh, that people of faith would look at those at somehow not consistent with what they'd been praying for, when in fact, it seems like it's right in the middle of that. But I don't wanna generalize. Every person of faith who has concerns about the vaccine generally has a series of questions about it, and they're not all the same. There's a lot of misinformation about whether this is something that is gonna be dangerous, causing infertility. Maybe it actually will give you the disease itself, which it won't. Uh, maybe there's a chip in that vaccine uh, needle that's going to allow people to track you around. No, that is not happening. There's so much noise out there. And again, I think people of faith may be trying to find where's a credible place to look to get those answers. Just one place I would say, Curtis Chang, who's a pastor, has done a whole series of videos uh, on Christians and the vaccine. People really ought to have a look at that. They're very well done. They're based on the facts. He deals with a lot of the information that's out there that are scaring people and tries to really put the truth into the picture. And as a pastor, somebody who believes in the truth, the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus said. I hope that will be something that people can look at if they're confused about what's going on. And listen to a credible source who's a pastor, not like me, some federal employee who runs a government agency, but somebody with that kind of credibility, because pastors have a lot they can do right now. Well, and you do Thank as you. well as a, as a person of faith, and thanks so much. And we'll make sure we highlight in this podcast uh, uh, a link uh, to, to that commentary. We're speaking today with Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institute of Health. You know, Dr. Collins, millions of, of deaths have occurred worldwide from COVID-19, and we're seeing a really troubling phenomena. Long COVID uh, is an increasingly prevalent outcome, uh, even amongst those who have mild cases. And I'm wondering how you're directing research at the National Institute of uh, Health to help us understand the complex nature of long COVID. And can you sh size up or describe uh, the syndrome of, of, of long-term COVID and its impact? 
It is one more reason we're really concerned about this virus. And it was unexpected that this respiratory virus would have this ability, and as many as a third of the people who have the acute illness, to have that illness linger on for weeks or even months with a variety of symptoms that are very troubling and puzzling. And that includes fatigue, palpitations, brain fog, where people really have difficulties uh, maintaining concentration that interferes uh, with work or school. Um, and we don't really understand the mechanism that is causing this virus to have that kind of lingering consequence. Is it that the virus is somehow still in the body, hidden away in some reservoir that we can't find? We don't see it there. Uh, is it the immune system has been activated in a way that it can't reset itself and is causing these symptoms? Is it some sort of effect on blood vessels? Because we know this virus does bad things to blood vessels. We don't know. We aim to find out. So at NIH, we have one of the largest cohort studies we've ever mounted to track tens of thousands of COVID-19 survivors, figure out who it is who gets long COVID, who doesn't, and what is the specific metabolism and immunology that could, we could learn about that would teach us what's going on and what to do about it. But we're still looking for those answers. By the way, this is one more reason for people who are skeptical about vaccines to really think about, do you want to pass up the chance uh, to be immunized? Because if you think that, OK, COVID-19 maybe doesn't sound that bad. I'm a young person. Young people get long COVID, too. And they may then spend months. And we don't know how long this can go on in a very impaired state. The vaccines prevent that. Another reason to roll up your sleeve. Dr. Collins, uh, looking back over our shoulders uh, to the first months, six months, nine months of the uh, pandemic, you know, it was testing, 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 right? We were so concerned about testing. And there were a lot of critiques that as a country, maybe we dropped the ball on standing up a testing infrastructure all along, across the country uh, as well as we could have. But we find ourselves at this point in the pandemic. And I wonder uh, if you could comment on, particularly in the United States, what's, what's the role of testing now? And maybe particularly rapid testing, what should that infrastructure look like in communities all across the country? That's another great question. Yeah, we did get off to a rocky start. Uh, NIH was asked by the Congress to jump in here back in April of 2020, and they gave us additional resources to try to develop new technologies, especially those that could give a rapid response at the point of care, so you didn't have to wait a day or two to get a result back from a central lab. That includes now home tests, uh, which you can get at the drugstore, a direct result of the program we founded called RADx, uh, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. So we're doing pretty well now in terms of being able to get rapid answers for people who have symptoms where you're worried about, is this COVID? And we need to worry about that because you want that person immediately isolated so they don't infect other people. What we haven't done so well is to figure out how to really put in place asymptomatic testing in places like schools and businesses, because that is a really important part of ending this pandemic. One of the more diabolical aspects of this SARS-CoV-2 virus is its ability to infect people at high viral loads who have no symptoms, and they then are infectious for others around them. Unless you do that kind of asymptomatic testing, especially in areas where you have a lot of people packed together, like schools, you're going to miss that. Now, we do have the technologies now to start to do that, but we haven't really quite figured out how to distribute them. And many organizations, be they businesses or schools, are looking for advice. Let me just mention a website that can help with that in terms of choosing amongst the options that are out there about what kind of testing you might want to put in place. And this is just called whentotest.org. When to test is just one word, dot org in an effort put together by NIH and MIT that I think a lot of places have found valuable. But you have to have the resources, of course. Testing's not free. The federal government has distributed a lot of money to the states for this, much of which hasn't been spent yet. People are still trying to figure out how best to apply the technology. But boy, here it's the fall and schools are starting up yeah. and Delta's out there. This would be a great time uh, to really pull that together. Dr. Collins, I want to pull the thread on Margaret's comment about infrastructure and talk really about vaccine distribution. 
you know, in America, we don't have an adult vaccine distribution system like we have with children uh, with a pediatric distribution. And we're seeing in Israel, the uh, COVID czar said we may need a, a fourth shot. We know already that it may not be like the flu. It may be not 12 months. It may be eight months. We don't know all of the data yet. Um, and the healthcare system is really strained. Our uh, health centers, our hospitals are strained in terms of just delivering regular care. Do you think we need a vaccine core or some group that's like the Peace Corps or VISTA that really uh, sets in place an infrastructure so every community has access to that where education could happen and the like? Because relying on the current health system seems to be straining it. And if we're into a long-term three to five year battle here, are we really prepared on our distribution model? Well, I think all of us who've looked at the U.S. healthcare system over the years uh, would agree that it's far from ideal and that COVID-19 has pointed out, for instance, the health disparities uh, that are very much part of our system where people really don't have equal access to healthcare depending on your resources. And this needs to be addressed, uh, not just for COVID, but for lots of other things. In terms of your question about a vaccine core, that's really the CDC's role. The problem is CDC has been hampered uh, by having had their resources cut over the years, and they depend on the states and the state health departments have been really working on fumes uh, as those budgets have also been severely constrained. We need to beef that system up. That's the place this needs to happen. I think we've got the ability to deliver vaccines because pharmacies have stepped into that, 75,000 of them. And so right now, 95% of the country is within five miles of a site that can give you a vaccine. The trick is the organizing of it, the delivery of the doses, and the database to keep track of where we are with all of this, which is important to do, but also uh, concerns people who are worried about privacy and tracking of medical information. We have a lot to sort out there. I think this ought to be the wake up call to get there. Unfortunately, there's some politics in that one too, so we're not quite there. But one of the things we have to do as far as lessons learned from this pandemic is to recognize that our public health system in the United States has been allowed to atrophy and it needs a big infusion of resources uh, to get back into a place that would be ready for something like this the next time. We've been speaking today with Dr. Francis Collins, director of the NIH and former leader of the team that mapped the human genome. You can learn more about his groundbreaking work by going to NIH.gov. You can follow his blog at directorsblog.nih.gov. You can follow him on Twitter at NIH director. Dr. Collins, thank you for your lifelong dedication for advancing biomedical research, seeking clues to some of the most confounding diseases uh, and conditions plaguing humanity, and for your tenacity in addressing the mysteries of the genomics and of this pandemic, and for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. I'm glad to have talked with you. We're all in this together. We're going to get through this, but we'll get through it faster if we really depend on the best science, and we've got a lot of that to offer. Absolutely. Oh, Thank you so Thank much, you Dr. So much. Collins. Yeah.